Hoi everyone! Um, I got a lot of requests um, after my last video for uh, some more information on how to make games for the Game Boy Advance other than just how to install uh, the Butano library. Uh, one that I got specifically was uh, Pong, and I thought, yeah, that's a great example. That's a very simple game. It's one of the very first video games. Um, and if I could build a simple example using Butano and then walk you through the source code on how I built it, uh, that might be an excellent way by which you guys can make your own games. Now, I want to make this as quickly as possible because I just ate uh, two-day-old Long John Silvers from the fridge, and I am not sure how much longer I have. So, wish me luck. When you're using Butano to make Game Boy Advance games, you are going to swear by this particular page. This is the uh, Butano documentation. Uh, every function, uh, every category of thing you can do with Butano is exceptionally well documented in here. In fact, uh, if you are feeling bored, um, you might want to go to, I believe, let's see if we can find it, right here, getting started. Um, there is some excellent, excellent, excellent information about how to install Butano, uh, best practices, how not how not to use too much RAM, uh, just lots and lots and lots of stuff in this particular document. Uh, you can find this just by googling Butano Docs. It's really easy. Secondly, I have built a project specifically for this video, um, and you can find it on my GitHub. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. I don't like how small the README is here. Um, but if you clone this particular repository, you will be able to follow along with everything that I'm doing in this tutorial. The link is in the description below. Now, this is a part two, technically. Um, I'm going to be assuming that you have uh, DevKit Pro installed. Um, and if you have it set up correctly, then you should be able to build this project right away. I went ahead and included the entire Butano library uh, in this repository, just so that there's absolutely nothing for you to set up. Uh, there should be no worries. You should be able to just go in, type the make command, and have your ROM. In fact, I even included a um, compiled version of the ROM so you can see what it will end up looking like. Get my hand around to here. So it's really simple. Like, it's not... Anything huge, I wrote it in like two hours. There we go. But you know, it's, it's feature complete. It's got everything you'd be looking for in a Pong game. And so I thought, yeah, anyway, so I'm just kidding, I don't think. Now, my recommendation for you um, upon getting started is that you use projects like this as a jumping off point. Um, not only is the best way to learn by just getting your hands dirty and playing around with projects, uh, but there is no boilerplate creation uh, like there would be for a Node.js project. Um, you do basically have to start from scratch. Uh, so I, I highly recommend downloading this uh, and just messing around with the code. Without further ado, let's jump in. Now, I will say real quick, um, the code itself is pretty well documented, as you can see here. Um, so before we get in too far, I'm going to explain to you some stuff that isn't in this documentation and is very important to know. Now, audio is one of the easiest things to work with when you're designing assets for the Game Boy Advance. Let's see if I have Audacity open. I can go and open it. Uh, you can really only have a 16 megabyte ROM on the Game Boy Advance. Now this particular uh, file is sitting at 44.1k uh, hertz, um, which is CD quality. Um, I do not recommend that most of your audio files are this high quality. I'm only able to get away with it because I have uh, literally only two sound effects. Um, what you can do generally if you want to decrease the sound, uh, if you want to decrease the size of a sound effect is by going here and then clicking, I think it's here, rate. You go to 8,000 hertz, and then once you have slowed it down, essentially to 8,000 hertz, you go to pitch and tempo, change speed, select the audio first, pitch and tempo, change speed, and uh, I think actually 500. That's what you want to set your percentage change to. This should go ahead and fix the pitch so it sounds right. Um, the audio will just be lower quality. Um, something that killed me on my uh, first Game Boy Advance game, uh, Tomblay Island, 
was uh, the size of the music. I had so many music tracks in the game. Um, it, it literally took up, I think, 60% of the file size. Now here's the fun bit. Um, this is a song I wrote in MIDI on my piano. Um, I took the MIDI file and I opened it in a program called OpenMPT. It's free and I highly recommend it. Once you have imported the MIDI, which is really easy to do, um, you can go ahead and add whatever instrument you want. Um, this isn't a tutorial for this software. That you, what you'll notice is that music on the Game Boy Advance um, is programmatic, and this is to save space. So I've just got an instrument sound uh, that's sampled, and then uh, information about what each of the individual notes sounds like. And when you play it, it sounds sort of like this. All right, note the names of these files, they will come up later. Now the next thing we're going to look into is our graphics folder. You have to understand that sprites on the Game Boy Advance are the building block for uh, just about every moving object. Uh, you do have backgrounds, and I do recommend Googling information about uh, different uh, Game Boy Advance drawing modes. Even though Butano obfuscates most of this, um, it's still good to know to just get your head around how exactly it works uh, and what the most optimal way to uh, set up your game scenes are. But keep in mind that we have sprites and backgrounds. Let's get into sprites first. I'm going to go over here to GIMP, uh, which is absolutely essential if you're going to be working with Game Boy Advance graphics. Now the, uh, the only sizes that sprites can be are 8x8, 16x16, 32x32, or 64x64. Uh, if you want to have a sprite sheet uh, where you have multiple different sprites, uh, in an animation. I don't get into that in this video, um, but you can do so by stacking them on top of each other. Uh, so for example, if I wanted to have multiple uh, sprites in a sprite sheet that were 32 by 32, um, I would just make the uh, file size, or I'd make the, yeah, the file size really, really, really tall, um, but keep the width to about 32. Um, and with the expectation that every individual sprite is 32 pixels tall. Now, another thing you'll need to keep in mind is that individual sprites uh, and backgrounds as well can be only at a maximum of 16 colors. You can make sure that you are sitting at 16 colors by going to uh, this menu right here and converting your file to an indexed, uh, indexed uh, type. I tend to like setting my maximum to 15 just to be safe. Um, color dithering is nice in some circumstances, especially if you're working with gradients, but I am not here, so I will turn it off, um, and I'll convert, and there we are. Now the first color in your color map will be your transparency color. Uh, red is my transparency color for this Pong paddle, um, so I make sure it's zero here in the front. Um, I did a very similar process with this sprite right here. Now this is our background. Um, Butano takes your background and it separates it into 8x8 tiles, um, and you can only have so many tiles in your background. Your background can be 256x256. 256 256. Um, in fact, I think it can be larger than that, but I've never played with it. Um, but you can only have so many tiles uh, in this particular file. So I tend to, if I'm using a static background that does not move, uh, I just include black bars at the top and bottom, so uh, I don't go over my maximum tile count. You'll notice I have these uh, these JSON files right next to each individual um, image. Um, this gives us uh, in Butano a little bit of information about each individual file. Uh, for example, sprites look like this. Uh, you can set their height right here. Um, you can also, let's go to the background. You can have multiple different types of backgrounds. There are certain kinds of backgrounds called affine backgrounds. Um, we will not be getting into those in this video. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, oftentimes you can copy these JSON files as boilerplate and adjust the height field to whatever is most accurate for your particular sprite. Now for the fun stuff! Let's get into the source code. Now, you'll notice that I have a ton of include uh, libraries here at the top. Uh, that is because Butano is very efficient. Uh, you don't lump everything in together as one big fat Butano library. Um, each of these individual libraries uh, you can cite from the Butano documentation. Let's take a look. Like for example, let's look at the string class. 
right here. Um, in order to use this class, I have to include this library. Uh, you want to include the minimum amount of libraries to get your program compiled and working. Um, too many and it might bloat the size and complexity of your ROM. Now if you notice, uh, for the image and backgrounds, we actually have to include those as header files themselves. Uh, this is in part because the Game Boy Advance does not have an operating system. Uh, it is not loading files from a file system, much like uh, modern game consoles or PCs would. Um, it has to actually convert these into raw data and then import them through header files. Music does not work this way. Um, all of your music items are imported right here at the top, um, but individual images do have to be imported like this. Now, int main. If you are familiar with C++, you'll know that this is your main function. This is the first block of code that your uh, compiler knows to go ahead and start your program in. You can include functions before this, um, but they won't be executed unless you call them. It is important that if you're initializing any variables that are of a Butano data type, um, that you do so after this init function. Um, you can use them in functions beforehand, but once your game actually starts, you will want to include this. Uh, there's more information about, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty, how to uh, work around this using uh, global variables, but it's not necessary for this program, uh, so we're not going to use that. Now you'll notice this is the same name as the music that I had written. Um, it's pulling it from the music items namespace. Um, this right here, now this isn't actually functional code, uh, this is just an example, um, but this right here is um, how loud you want it to play. I was going to use this as an example. You can uh, create a certain data type called a fixed, uh, I don't think it's called a fixed flint, I, it's, it's just called a fixed. Um, what it does is it simulates the functionality of a floating point variable, uh, which you can technically use on Game Boy Advance, but because the architecture is not optimized for it, it will cause slowdown. Uh, so I highly recommend using this to represent uh, numbers that are in between zero and one, or you know, obviously have a trailing decimal, um, you know, if you can help it. We don't actually need that for this program. Get rid of that, so let's scroll down. All right, so you'll notice that there is a distinction between a regular background item and a regular background pointer. Now, this right here uh, sets the data type for this variable, bg, which will represent our background variable. Um, and this pointer um, does not store the actual uh, full data of the background, but rather it stores some uh, information about it such as uh, a reference to the area on the cartridge uh, or on the ROM where that data is stored, uh, the X and Y. Um, this is a more efficient way to handle the data. You can actually move the background such that when it is created it is not created in the very center of the screen. I have done this sometimes but we don't need that so we're just going to create it at X 0 Y 0. Now, down here, uh, a very similar set of commands are going to create our paddles. Uh, we've got a left paddle and a right paddle. Now, they actually pull from the exact same sprite, except the right paddle gets flipped. Um, I will actually, real quick, I wasn't going to do this at first, but I think you guys might appreciate this. Set horizontal flip. So, if you want to know what you can do with a sprite pointer, you can go to the Butano documentation and look up the sprite pointer class. Now, uh, public functions. You can do things like set the scale, uh, obviously, uh, let's see. Yeah, it uses the fixed data type like I mentioned earlier, so it can be less than one if you want it to be. Um, there's the shear, but I'm looking for flip. There we go and it consumes a boolean. Uh, this automatically sets, uh, this sets whether or not I want the sprite to be flipped along the horizontal axis. Um, so you can do lots and lots and lots of different things to these sprite pointers, and this is just one of them. Um, so I just wanted to show you where I found that command. So this way we save some space, so we don't need to make two different, uh, we don't need to make two different uh, paddle sprites. Now, 
negative 140 and 140. The Game Boy Advance has a screen resolution of 240 by 160, and that is not a lot of space. It's more than you would you would think it is. Um, you can actually do quite a bit um, using that resolution, uh, but it's not a lot. Let's move on. So uh, using the fundamentals that we learned earlier, let's create the ball. Uh, so we're going to create that in the center of the screen. Here are some variables. Uh, this is our this is an integer to represent our score. Um, I don't include in this particular example, as you saw, um, a enemy score. Um, I simply have one, and it goes up when you get a point, and goes down when you lose one. Um, now we also have a boolean value that represents whether or not the enemy is going up. Now this is important because a lot of people new to programming don't realize um, that you have to keep in mind um, and account for everything that you want to happen. Everything that you want to happen. Uh, the paddle doesn't inherently know what direction it's supposed to be going. You have to keep track of that. So it's going to move up until this variable that says, okay, we're not going to go up anymore, tells it to start moving down, and then it will start moving down. And in order to control what direction it goes, uh, we simply set this variable. Now going down, um, delta, like I mentioned here, means change. Uh, these two variables represent uh, for each individual step of the game loop, uh, what direction I want the ball to go in. So if the delta x is negative, um, then it will be moving to the left. And if it's positive, it will be moving to the right. If y is negative, it will be moving up. And if y is positive, it will be moving down. And because this is how much I want to change per step, uh, the higher you make that number, the faster it goes. So because it's set to 0, 0, uh, obviously the ball will be stopped when we first start playing the game. Now, as is the case with many different libraries, um, randomness is actually very difficult to achieve um, computationally, especially if you want it to be cryptographically secure. So what we do is we have an object uh, where the creator of Butano has thankfully um, taken a lot of the complexities out and moved them into this particular object. We just have to create an instance of it and then we can take advantage of um, you know, the optimizations for this particular architecture. Same thing with this. Now, um, every engine handles text a little bit differently. And unfortunately, this is not quite as straightforward um, as the other uh, things that I've discussed. So you're just going to have to memorize this, essentially. Now, the text generator object will consume a, uh, a, a graphic that is in the common uh, folder. I've gone ahead and included this. Uh, a lot of Futana projects use this, so this isn't something that I made for this project. Um, this is essentially a font, a sprite font um, of 8x8 eight eight sprites um, that each represent a single letter. Um, we only need to create this one time, or at least for every individual line of text that we would be making, which in our case is just one. Next is a vector. Um, I am surprised how few people graduating uh, with computer science degrees know what a vector is. So a vector is a lot like a stack, except, except you can access things uh, in the stack individually. And for the most part, uh, vectors will actually dynamically increase in size as you add things to them, um, which is really, really nice. So this is going to represent the individual sprites that make up the words that we want to put on the screen. Um, so if you put the word score up, you're going to have one sprite for each individual letter in the word score, and that's going to be stored in this vector, which will be initially at a size of zero, but as we add the letter S, uh, the size will go up to one, and then we add C, goes up to two, and so on, um, until if, you know, if score is the only thing we're including, it will have a size of five. Um, this becomes a very, very useful data structure uh, in many, many cases. And uh, it has certain advantages over uh, directly using arrays, even though it is essentially array, it, it is an array with uh, a few extra perks. Now, we are going to create some default text. Um, this function right here, which is part of the text generator object that we initialized, um, has an X value this, a y value of this, and these are arbitrary, like I mentioned. I just fiddled around until I found something good that worked. Um, and this is a constant char array, or a c string, 
um, that just includes the text press A to start. And it can be anything as long as it's less than 16 characters. And then we just include the reference to the vector as you see, and it will go ahead and take these individual letters, find the corresponding sprite in the font, and then add them to this vector and put them on the screen at this location. Now, a game loop. You don't see this oftentimes in uh, many modern game engines like Unity or Godot, um, but a, a uh, mainstay of classic video game programming is the main loop. Now, like I mentioned, there is no operating system on the Game Boy Advance. We want to be able to run your program and do absolutely nothing else. Um, so it is imperative that we never leave this loop. So I've gone ahead and set while true. So it'll, it'll never be able to escape. Now let's take a look here. So I've got an if statement uh, and then some logic here that will execute if the uh, argument within the if statement is found to be true. Um, if the keypad up held and left paddle Y is greater than negative 48. So the idea being that if you are pushing the up button on the controller, or I guess not really a controller, I don't know what you call it for a handheld console, the up button, um, and you are not going off the screen, um, it will set your Y to where your Y currently is, minus one. And that'll move you up on the screen. Um, and you can see we have the inverted version of that down here, where you have down held, where Y is, if Y is, uh, less than 48, uh, where it takes your Y value and it increases it by one. Now I've included an else here, and you'll see a lot of else's in this code, um, so that you can't push the two at the same time. Now on a physical unit, um, you wouldn't be able to do this. But obviously, uh, <laughs> I, I gave you an example on an emulator, and most people tend to play these on emulators, so it's important that you include this because uh, on an emulator, if you're using your keyboard, uh, you can push both of them at the same time. Now, remember what I mentioned earlier about the Boolean value enemy going up. Uh, most of you should know this, but for those who don't know, a Boolean value is a value that can only be true or false. Down here I have an else statement, and I'm able to only put else because as, a natural, as the natural state of a Boolean value can only be one of two states, if it is not one state, it has to be the other one. So this is true. This only executes if it's false. And remember, like I mentioned, this is the value that controls whether or not it's going up or down. So this is if we want it to go up. We watch the Y value, and if the Y is greater than negative 48, um, and then we go ahead and move it up. Um, however, if this is not the case, if it's reached the edge of the map, we go ahead and set this value to false. Now, I am including an else here as well because what this means is it's not going to check uh, what the value of this is until we finish the game loop and start up at the top. Um, that is just to make sure that we have consistency for both of these because otherwise, if I just made this an if statement, um, it would probably go uh, up farther one pixel than it would go down even if the 48 and the 48 here are the same number. And that's just due to fall through logic, uh, which you have to be extremely aware of in some circumstances. There are no switch statements in this code, um, but switch statements have, I love them, but they've killed me because I will forget to include a break clause and the fall through logic will ruin, will ruin the code. This right here is the same thing, but it's inverted. Uh, let's move on down. So we've got if button keypad A pressed and delta X, which remember is the uh, movement in X of the ball is zero and the delta Y is zero. So this is if the ball is not moving and the A button is pressed, this means that we want to start a round. So it'll clear the vector that includes all of the sprites that make up the message on the screen. You have to run this before a generate command unless you have never run the generate command before. And this is because it will just continue to be putting uh, letters at the end of that vector, which means that you'll very quickly run out of space and it'll just look ugly. So you wanna make sure you clear it before you continue. Now we've got a uh, string value here. 
um, text score equals score plus button to string score plus Butano to string score. This converts the integer into a Butano string value. Um, just keep in mind uh, everything everything that a computer does is in numbers. Uh, there are no letters on computers. There are only numbers that represent letters. And so the raw data 32 as an integer does not mean 32 in letters that it will put on the screen. So it's very important that we convert it. Um, and then once we're done, we just run generate and put it on the screen. Now I realized <laughs> as I'm going through this um, that I set up this value to be uh, size 32 while the vector itself is size 16. Uh, this should not be an issue unless you get a score of like 16, 160,000 or something, you know, like a, like a huge score, um, which I don't anticipate that anybody will. Uh, but this could technically be uh, a edge case that produces an error down the line. So just be aware of stuff like that. As you can see, I have quite a bit of uh, an explanation as to what's going on down over here. Um, and this is because a lot of people I know don't know what a modulus is or how it works. Now, a modulus is a um, arithmetical, is that the word? It's an arithmetic operator. Um, the idea being that it returns the remainder of a division, of a quotient. Um, and that sounds a little bit weird and ambiguous, but let's take a look at these uh, examples over here. So the idea, uh, what you can think of it is as a, it's, it's a number that allows you to wrap around um, as if you're going in a circle. So if I have an X value that is increasing by one and I give it a modulus of three, this is what the output should be. And I think this will help it make sense to you. So I have zero, one, two, three, four, five, modulus three, zero, one, two, zero, one, two. Notice how it's wrapping around the three value. Um, this really doesn't seem to be very useful in mathematics, but in computer science, it is absolutely essential. Uh, in the back end, these things are used all over the place. Um, and a lot of that is just due to the fact that um, arrays are of a fixed size, and you don't want to have your program uh, counter going off um, into left field and just reading random data. Um, this uh, keeps things contained by connecting the end to the beginning. So what we're doing here is we're able to save a little bit of complexity um, by allowing uh, the random object to uh, generate integers as it does and then wrap them around to what we want uh, the maximum random integer to return as. So I, I want to be able to get a random number from zero to four. I can do that by calling random get integer modulus five. Um, even though the get integer will return, <laughs> I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll return a random integer from zero to like 16,000. It doesn't matter uh, because I'm using this modulus and it takes whatever number that is and wraps it around to something uh, between zero and four. Now, uh, the reason why I have it wrapped in a while delta x equals zero, delta y equals zero, is because while I'm ge generating a new direction for the ball to go, uh, I want to make sure the ball isn't either going in a straight line, because that would be boring, or a vertical line, um, because that would do nothing. So it has to be going in two different directions, so to speak. Now I have it generate from zero to four, and then I subtract two, and the idea for that is that um, this is just a simpler way of creating a number that could be between uh, one and two um, that is either positive or negative. So I create zero to four and then I shift it down so that zero is in the center and now I've saved a few instructions. Now uh, here is where we just play a sound. Uh, all the sound effects for this were recorded with my voice so I apologize for that ahead of time. Uh, you'll notice that I um, it's the same name as the file, so it's really easy to remember how to find your sound items. Uh, but you have to include the sound items header in the top, like you saw. Now, let's record the movement. Uh, you'll notice that I am setting the ball's X and Y values relative to the existing values plus delta X. Now, if delta X is negative two, plus negative two means minus two. So it'll be moving it to the left. 
Um, and this is how we get the ball to move in random directions. You could also use set position, and I actually used this later on for a uh, different object, or it might be the same object, and just in a different context. Um, but I'm, I'm breaking it out to set X and Y so you can clearly see what's going on. Now, what's interesting about the rest of these, and I'll close these in my editor, um, is that you'll notice there's a pattern here. Um, this is if the ball is too far on the left side of the field. This is if the, if the ball is too far on the right side of the field. Uh, this is if it hit the top of the screen, and this is the bottom. These two are basically identical. Um, I will still show you them, but a, a lot of what you learn here will be relevant in the next one. Um, so this right here is a common technique I use for determining what the distance is of something. An absolute value um, basically takes a positive number and keeps it as a positive, uh, but it takes a negative number and it turns it into a positive. Uh, so if I got 16, it would return 16, but if I got negative 16, it would return positive 16. Um, and this allows me to very conveniently uh, detect the distance between these two y values. Uh, the idea being, since the paddles are 64, um, that means there are 32 pixels from, like the paddle is 32 pixels uh, from the center of the object in both directions, which means that if the, if the distance between the ball and the paddle um, is within that range, then it hit the paddle. And if it hit it, um, we invert the delta x value, which means we bounce it horizontally by taking this value and multiplying it by negative one, and then we play the sound effect. However, uh, if you miss, um, it deducts your score, it sets the ball to position zero, zero, um, and it sets your delta x and delta y, which are the speed of the ball, uh, to zero each respectively. Now, I am duplicating a lot of this code right here. You'll see this often, and you won't want to do this when you're writing your own code. I'm only breaking it out like this because I want to um, make it more clear to you what the logical flow of the program is. Um, so this is not necessarily the most efficient way to write the code, uh, but this is the most obvious. So I just clear the sprites, um, I generate the text as I did before, and I stick it in the same location. Uh, so this is why when you are running the program, you'll notice that it adds the press A to continue. Now, we've got uh, the same thing down here, uh, but you'll notice I took the comments away. Wow, look how compact this is without comments, it's crazy. Now, top of the screen, uh, same as the bottom of the screen, um, it just inverts the delta Y, uh, which means it causes it to bounce vertically and plays this sound effect. Now, this is something you will want to know. If you include the log header, which is here at the top, uh, I think you can see it right up there. Uh, it's like, it's already selected, basically. Um, you will write uh, a certain uh, number, or you can actually write text as well, as long as you separate it with a comma. Like, I could do score. Did I include this right? Yeah, that looks about right. Um, you can do this, um, and it will uh, print this to your uh, Game Boy Advance emulator's log. Now, you will want to remove every instance of this when you finally create the ROM and distribute it, uh, because it will slow down your code. Um, but I'll show you exactly what this does when we play the game. And then finally, this is uh, perhaps the most important thing you can do. You have to run this right here. Otherwise, uh, the music will lock up, nothing will happen on the screen, it might be calculating stuff in the memory, but you won't be able to know, it'll be as if your program freezes. You know when you have a proper game loop, because it'll be a while loop with uh, this function right here. Now you can include this in a for loop if you want to have a uh, particular delay, like you want to delay 16 frames while without stopping the music. Um, you can also do things like implement a pause functionality by wrapping this in like while not start pressed and then you have the, the core update. So it's very useful and versatile. Let's go back over here to the game. Pull up the logs. Notice I got to the logs by clicking tools, view logs. So I'll play this a little bit. I'll kind of get a score going so I can show you. There we go. Notice when I push the B, well, it's the B button. It's the Z key on my keyboard, but it corresponds to the B button. 
I have a value of one here in the log. And now we're done. Now let's go ahead and make this. I'll show you how to make it. So let's go to our terminal. Um, you'll know how to set this up uh, if you follow the tutorial that I already gave you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and go to my Ubuntu documents. I'm trying to remember where I put it. There we go. All right. Once you're in your project folder, uh, what you will notice is not this folder right here, but once you move into uh, games and then into Palm, you're sitting right here. Uh, you can go ahead and go here. The way that I typically like to write the uh, make command is clear semicolon, which separates the commands. All clear does is just clear the screen, make, and then I will put forward slash j16. My processor has 16 cores in it, so I can run this. Um, if you have two cores, you'll put a hyphen j2. If you have four cores, you'll put hyphen j4, uh, so on and so forth. Let's go ahead and run. It doesn't take a long time, uh, but once it's done and it says ROM fixed and you don't have any errors, uh, you will arrive at having created your very own .gba file. So if you have any questions for me, um, if any of this didn't make any sense to you, um, feel free to leave a comment below. Um, if you have any specific questions about games you want to make or you're curious if there is a game you can make, um, I would be happy to answer those questions. I've made two Game Boy Advance games myself um, that I won't say like completely take advantage of the light of the console, but you know they're, they're about the same quality as like the uh, movie tie-in games that you would find at the store. So I'm pretty, I, I, I'm pretty savvy about the architecture. Um, I am also a member of a Game Boy Advance development uh, Discord server that includes the creator of the Butano engine as well as many developers who are way more experienced uh, than I am at this particular subject. Uh, the link to that will be in the description of this video. And if that's all, um, then I hope you guys have a great day and good luck.